Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bureau webinar, Neurodiversity in the Workplace, Implementing Inclusiveness. I'm Kay Quillen, I'm the Bureau Marketing Manager, and I'm joined this morning by a fantastic panel of experts. Um, I'm going to hand over to them shortly, but just quickly to run through the format for this morning, we're going to have a 40 minute panel discussion followed by approximately 20 minutes Q&A. And you can submit your questions at any time during the discussion using the icon at the bottom of your screens. Um, we will also be conducting two polls throughout the discussion. Um, they're completely anonymous and we'd really appreciate your participation. Um, there will also be an anonymous survey at the very end of the webinar. And again, it'd be great to have your feedback. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand over to the Bureau Commercial Director, Dave Bell, to introduce the topic and our guest panellists. Dave. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Kay. Um, so, yeah, as Kay mentioned, I'm the Commercial Director for Bureau Group. Um, Bureau Group um, has a, a, a range of businesses, being one being Bureau Workspace, which caters for furniture consultancy and procurement. Within that as well, we have our Bureau Move Division, which is a circular economy solutions business um, geared around furniture and IT reclamation. Ply Living is a sister company which caters for uh, furniture consultancy and procurement as well, but within the hospitality, care home, build to rent and student accommodation markets. And finally, we have Bureonomics and Bureonomics is very much geared around supporting clients to enhance and improve well-being with their staff, really around the, pro the, the DSE function um, for both home working and uh, in the workspace, offering a number of products and services around that. Um, just before I hand over uh, to Alison and Jean and, and, and go into the conversation, I thought it'd be good, obviously, just to give you a bit of background as to why we've decided to um, have this conversation today, which we feel is, is an extremely important one. The, the subject of well-being um, is, is something that's spoken about widely um, across uh, the commercial sector um, and within the public sector as well and it's gained particular prominence it's fair to say uh, over the course of the pandemic for obvious reasons the subject of neurodiversity is something um, in terms of its awareness is, is growing and it very much sits within that conversation around well-being and as we'll come on to um, we feel that it's it's hugely important to raise awareness around the subject of neurodiversity because not only will it help to benefit businesses but it will undoubtedly um, help to benefit people um, and, and improve well-being within businesses. So uh, without further ado I will hand over to Alison. Thank you, David, and it's great to be here this morning with you all. My name's Alison Cox. I'm the director of 3i, and 3i stands for Investors in Inclusiveness. You can see why I abbreviate it. Um, we work in the field of training and consultancy and provision of advice um, across the public sector, the private sector, and indeed the third sector. And you're going to hear more about my passion for, for implementing inclusiveness as, as the uh, course of the morning goes on. Um, I'm also uh, an external verifier for the Scottish Qualifications Authority and a qualif qualification design specialist in the field of equality, diversity and inclusion. So I verify uh, the provision that all the post-school education providers in Scotland make uh, by way of uh, welcoming diversity and implementing inclusiveness. And in addition to that, um, I sit on, I'm a member of the, the Scottish Health Council, which is part of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And my particular remit and my particular focus there is in addressing health inequalities, uh, which are rife, uh, not just in the commercial and business sector, but, but in the community and in the, uh, the country in general. Uh, so plenty there to, to keep me out of mischief. Jean? Good morning everyone, delighted to be here. So I'm Jean Hewitt, I'm an inclusive design consultant with Bureau Hapold. So Bureau Hapold is a multidisciplinary uh, organisation worldwide and um, I work within the inclusive design team which basically looks at accessibility, wellbeing and, and people-centric design. Um, I've been in that role at Bureau Hapold for a few years, I've been in inclusive design for over 20 and for the last 18 months I've been working 
a lot on uh, developing a new standard for DSI, um, which is uh, a PAS level, it's a publicly available specification, which is currently out for uh, public consultation. And the title of that standard is PAS 6463, Design for the Mind, uh, Neurodiversity and the Built Environment. Um, so, uh, I'm a, uh, so I'm an expert in inclusive design, not necessarily an expert in, in neurodiversity, but over the last 18 months, I've learned a great deal working with um, a fantastic steering group of experts with you know, over 30 years experience in this. Um, so we'll be touching on that today. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. So hopefully everyone can see uh, the screen here. So just as, a, as an introduction, um, in terms of, well, Alison, if we can start with, with your, oh, sorry, Kay. Oh, sorry, Dave, I'll just let that run for a wee minute to give everyone a chance to answer. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so Alison, um, if we can start off, what, what do we mean when we talk about implementing inclusiveness and, and, and who does it benefit? That's a very good question, David, and it may seem counterintuitive to begin my response by explaining what inclusiveness isn't. But my reason for doing so is to dispel a widely held myth. And this myth is that implementing inclusiveness means striving to find one option, one setup, one design that suits everyone. And that one size fits all approach definitely isn't um, inclusiveness and it's outdated and, and misguided. Uh, I don't claim that I've never held that, that impression. Uh, many brains have expended many what I call thought years uh, on the quest to find a universal design for everything from the, the supermarket trolley to the crash helmet, from the door handle to the reception desk. And the main stumbling block along the road to success in this uh, quest for uh, universal design is that we're human and we come in all different shapes and sizes. We have different minds and different ways of thinking. We share many traits uh, as human beings, but we differ in lots of ways too. And our difference makes us diverse and diversity needs variety. Creators of inclusive environments, and both Jean and I are very uh, much involved in this uh, and have been for, for decades. Um, we, we, as creators of these inclusive environments, um, we share many traits, uh, but we also recognize that whether we're designing learning spaces or, or workplaces, whether we're designing shops or restaurants, banks or theaters, we understand this foundational principle. Uh, and so what we do is we set out with the intention of designing flexible, adaptable spaces, which enable users of those spaces to have some autonomy, some control over their environments. And that enables them to fulfill their true potential, to thrive, uh, and to coin a phrase I often use, to be the best versions of themselves in, in that setting. Now, the gardeners amongst you will need no reminder that different plants need different growing conditions in order to thrive and flourish. Some need uh, sunny uh, positions where others do best in shade. Uh, some require regular watering where others um, fail if you overwater them. Some flowers grow rapidly while others take a long time to come into bloom. People are like this too, um, and different people flourish in different environments. So by way of conclusion uh, to this question, David, I would say that expecting and accepting diversity of your workforce, and that applies to everybody who's joined today and everybody who's listening to this later, uh, accepting and, and recognizing um, the, the diversity and welcoming the diversity of the workforce, as well, of course, as the diversity of your customers and your client base, the people who use your business. That's a very good starting point, because when you commit to implementing inclusiveness, I go so far as to say you'll benefit everybody and you'll disadvantage nobody. Yeah. And, and Jean, I mean, it's probably it's it's important, I guess, 
to try and define, if we can, what, what, what we mean by the term neurodiversity. What, what would you, how would you go about doing that? What would you say to that? It's an interesting question. Um, so when I, when I first started as technical author of the PAS, one of the first discussions we had was around um, neurodiversity and what we mean by that. Um, so we discussed terminology at length and the steering group of experts myself eventually came to the conclusion that we would stick with the formal definition that neurodiversity is the variation of neurocognitive profiles across the whole population. Um, and collectively, there are um, a few broad groups within that that are widely recognized, I believe. So there's neurotypical, which is the majority group. And then there are two minority groups. So neurodivergent being one, which is uh, most often a variation from the neurotypical that exists from birth. And well known examples will be uh, autism, ADHD, and so forth. And then there's neurodegenerative, um, which is acquired either through a, a brain injury or often an age-related condition such as uh, dementia or Parkinson's. So many people are recognized that people who are not neurotypical process sensory information differently and the built environment's got a really big role to play in that. However, what I would add is people don't necessarily fall tidily into a box or label. And that what I found during the 18 months or so we've been processing this PAS document is they found a lot of people have contacted me and say, are you covering my needs? and they've got something that I've not heard of before, or people have got one or two spikes. So a typical example might be um, uh, people who suffer from migraines might be affected by lighting. So there are many, there's, there's, it's not as easy. We're all messy and, uh, and diverse, basically. So yeah. we can broadly split into three categories, but neurodiverse, we are talking about the whole population. Sometimes um, some people with neurodivergent conditions do call themselves neurodiverse rather than neurodivergent, um, but we're trying to stick to the sort of formal definitions of neurodiverse being everyone, neurodivergent being uh, someone who's not neurotypical. Yeah. I hope that okay. Happens. Great. Thanks. And and Alison, why why do you think it is then that the, the business world or the corporate world is 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 beginning to have the conversation around implementing inclusiveness? Well, I'd love to say that the shakers and movers in the corporate world are talking about inclusiveness because it excites them uh, or, or out of compassion for others. Uh, and whilst that will undoubtedly be the, the motivation for some, I've been in this business long enough to be not so naive as to make the case for inclusiveness solely on, on that pretext. The, the strongest case for implementing inclusiveness um, is found in the data. A recent study concluded that 20% of the UK population could be considered as neurodivergent in some way. Now, even if you're skeptical, skeptical listening to this, that, that one in five of your colleagues or one in five of your employees identify as neurodiverse, bear in mind that 20% of the UK population represents one in five of your potential customers and your potential clients too. I could say, put your hand up, and we won't know if you are, but put your hand up if you can afford uh, to take the reputational risk of not including um, that 20%. Um, and uh, if you're okay on missing out on their business or on their custom, because by failing to talk about inclusiveness and to seek to implement it, in a sense, that's what you're doing. You're missing out on 20% of your potential customer base, 20% uh, of your clients. Um, and when it comes to recruitment, who would knowingly want to miss out on the talent and creativity offered by 20% of the applicants? Because guess what? One in five of job applicants show signs of neurodivergence too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Jean, Alison's touched on one or two of the benefits there, but is, is there any other benefits that you would um, that you would mention then in terms of how how more inclusiveness benefits businesses, people, and indeed society? Um, I think Alison spelled it out very well, but what I would add is that um, if, you want, if you want an inclusive business, if you want to provide an inclusive service, we cannot continue to ignore this when we're designing buildings. And when we do, it, it's wrong on all levels. So it's discriminatory for a start. It affects morale of everyone. So not just those that experience the difference. It loses excellent employees over time. 
and, and that in turn can affect both your bottom line and the company's position in terms of PR and everything else. So I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, we'll move on to um, our next topic, which is probably one that everyone's hugely interested in, is returning to the office, so reassessing the workplace to meet everyone's needs. So, Alison, if we can start with yourself, um, to what extent would you say the last 18 months, with all the challenges that it's brought, has compelled us to reevaluate the workplace and take more, more notice of our, our employees' diverse needs? Do you know what, David? I think we kid ourselves if we believe that it was ever possible to run a successful business without an awareness of what motivates our employees and what gives them a sense of well-being at work. But we certainly need to take notice of their diverse needs more than ever um, as we emerge from the pandemic um, and as we adjust to future patterns of working. I've been doing a lot of work with a lot of different clients around coping strategies to thrive in the new normal and I feel that I'm misleading people when I say that there is this single concept of the new normal because I speak with organizations who are planning to continue um, with a default position of work remotely if you can I work with others who've had no option. I was working yesterday with a manufacturing client uh, whose people have been on site throughout the pandemic, but just adjusting to, to ways of working. And then I work with others who are contemplating a move to hybrid working and, and a pattern of hybrid working, flexible working, a, a range of options. And when we think about it, working remotely was a situation that became the overnight reality for so many back on March the 23rd, 2020. And it's had its ups and downs. How often have people today uh, said that, you know, oh, it's had its ups and downs. Um, and, and that's an expression that most of us will have heard many times. Um, but employers need to be aware that for our neurodivergent people, the flexibility, the lack of distractions, uh, the being on your own at work, uh, the sense of being able to sort of customize your home office to suit what you need, to light it the way you need it, to have the, the, the furnishings the way you need it, and not to have to share that or compete, and not to be distracted by lots of um, noise, such as we uh, have in the past experienced in open plan offices, that comfort, that control for somebody who uh, has got used to it and is actually flourishing in it is not surprisingly making them reluctant to want to return to the workspace. Um, so what I would say is that in order to, um, if you like, encourage uh, people back into the workplace to, to make it a place they want to be, um, the experience in the office needs to be more enticing perhaps than it was before. Um, not that it's all about um, making our uh, employees uh, feel as though they have got um, the optimal conditions in the office and they don't have at home. It's not about drawing that comparison necessarily, but I do think that workplaces need to be uh, the employer needs to think about the workplace in order to recognise that if we're going to get the best from our people when we do bring them back into the, the corporate workspace, there needs to be uh, a sense that it's a good place to be. It's a place where I can continue or where, where you can continue or where they can continue to do their, their best work. Because otherwise I fear, and I mean, I face this as, as a business owner myself, I, I face the possibility that people have got so used to um, being uh, a remote worker or, or working from situations other than the corporate HQ and so on, um, that they'll want to, they'll be reluctant to return. Um, and they may um, pose the question, you know, why should I bother coming in? You know, I've proved that over the last 18 months I can do what I do at a distance. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a really important conversation um, and it's a particularly important conversation amongst our neurodivergent colleagues and employees um, because they will have adapted and they may well have found that they feel better and they work better when they're not around all of us. Yeah. So it's an interesting point. 
Yeah, it's definitely a conversation that has been had uh, a lot over the past um, 18 months, I would say, certainly with the number of the, with the clients that we're speaking to. Um, and how would you say, Alison, again, sorry if I can come back to you, is how do businesses or how would you say businesses benefit from encouraging reluctant team members back to the office environment for at least some of the time? Well, there, there's so much to be gained from being back as part of, um, uh, you know, a, a collective, uh, because we all know um, that we work in teams. Teams has taken on a new connotation since Microsoft hijacked it as their as their um, communication platform. But but the team is a very important concept. Um, we we're not islands. We're, we you know we're, we're not silos. We you know we don't do our best work when we're isolated. Um, and whilst I would be the first. Uh, to celebrate the extent to which technology has en enabled us to continue to be together um, as uh, you know, a geographically dispersed uh, group, just as we're a geographically dispersed group today, um, I still feel very strongly that inclusive work, uh, collaborative work, creativity um, is sparked best uh, when you're in and around other people. And it's about creating environments where you can have that benefit of collaborat collaborating. Because you know what's been lost from, from the, the last 18 months in terms of the workspace? It's the informal opportunities, the incidental opportunities to check in with each other, to, to look at the sort of nonverbal signals that tell you that a colleague's struggling. You don't necessarily get that if, if you are working from home it, you know but let's face it we're all seen from the neck upwards on today's session you don't know whether I'm wearing my PJ bottoms or whether I'm you know uh, dressed up to the nines um, that that's irrelevant because it's not what we wear that, that uh, tells us how we feel but but you miss a lot you miss a lot when you're not connected with each other um, and certainly in relation to well-being and, and we'll talk about this later because I know um, in terms of the environment um, Jean has got a lot of really um, interesting things to share but but that work environment that corporate environment if it allows for the socialization the collaboration uh, the sparking off of ideas um, then it it adds something it adds value adds value to the workplace which we can't truly and fully replicate while we're all working remotely from each other yeah great and Jean, is, is there anything you would add to that in terms of how this will improve working conditions for, for all employees? Yeah, so the first thing to say would be, if you're looking at designing for neurodiversity, then you're designing for everyone, of course, and there is no one that, with the recommendations you've put into the past, for example, who would be disadvantaged by that. Um, so almost everyone could potentially benefit but people with neurodivergent conditions like this benefit much more, of course, because of the severity of some of their hypersensitivity that sometimes is experienced and so on. Um, I think it's really, really important. And some companies have already done this, um, but I think it needs to be looked at and go, and go further, is to have you know, the opportunity to sit in different types of space, not just because of your neurocognitive profile, but also because of um, the type of activity that's going on so when you are collaborating and meeting and being social or you want to have the the um, serendipity of the photocopy chat and, and find out a bit more about another department or specialist or, or so on that's it's really golden but also there are times when you need to get your head down and, and write reports or take a very serious meeting so the flexibility for offices to provide both is really really important it would be the key aspect i think yeah Great. Okay. Well, that takes us on then to how we could start to improve the working environment. Um, and Jean, this is a topic that, that you've covered extensively in, in, in the report that you've, you've conducted. Um, what changes to workplace design do we think will positively impact the environment and promote inclusivity? Uh, there are so many. So there are many elements that can be potentially improved, but I say in the introduction to the standard, even just picking up one of those strands will help somebody. Ideally, you'd look at them because it has a cumulative um, and combined effect on people. So, for example, you could look at just lighting and it will make a big impact on people. But um, the lighting combined with the noise and the patterns and the finishes and everything else to bombard people on the senses. So looking at everything is really helpful. Um, generally, we've, we've got about 15 sections in the PAS, and I would group them broadly into three areas, and I think the, the clearest way to put this across, really, 
The first is um, the clarity of the space. Um, by clarity of space, I do mean um, ability to wayfind and the sequencing and, and, and there's no labyrinths and things like that. But I also mean about um, reasonable acoustics and, and lighting that helps the clarity of the space, avoiding um, vivid colors and, and, and some intense patterns, particularly linear ones, not so much the fractal ones. And, and also looking at noise. So it could be continuous background noise, or it could be sudden intermittent noises, or it might be even a quiet noise, like a ticking clock. So all of these can impact di people differently. So the clarity of the space was the first, first area. The second one is the control of the space. Um, in an ideal world, we would all be able to flick a switch and adjust every bit of the environment like we can at home, as, as Alison said, to make it just what we personally want. Well, realistically, that's not gonna happen. So I think it's going to be a combination of some places where you can adjust the lighting, the acoustics and so on. And, other, and, and sometimes that control will come from the ability to move to another zone. So the area over the other side of the office is quieter. That's a quiet zone, but get your head down or there's a little room or a, a booth or something I can book when I've got a serious you know, conversational teams meeting and things like that. So a bit of a mix. So control of the space, really, really important. A key part of control for the person experiencing the anxiety would be the ability to preview what they're going into. So when it's your own workspace, you get to know what it's like. Um, but if you're going in, so covering all building types, you might be going to you know, another office, you be, could, could be going out on site and that. The ability to look at where you're going before you go there is really helpful to someone who experiences hypersensitivity. So, Technology can have a big role in this. It could be an app that tells you how busy King Cross Station is, so that's on your route, you know, at this precise time, or um, it just shows you what the space looks like and, and, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's another part of control. And then the third one, which is really, really important, is the calm space. So here we're talking about quiet rooms or restorative spaces. And we've got quite a big section in the PAS about that because it's so very important. So if you only had, if you could only do one thing, I would say, please have one of these, or if not, you know, several or more of them. So um, that's a really, really important thing. So there's lots of guidance gone in about that and it is backed up with some research. So I, I think that would be helpful. Shouldn't be doubled up with faith or first aid or anything like that though. It's definitely a space that can go to on a reactive basis when someone experiences that sensory overload. Yeah. Okay. So that was a whirlwind, sorry, but um, I, I'm happy to answer on any of those. No, no, that, that was great. Um, thank you for that. Um, so then finally, we'll come on to um, well-being at, at work. Um, Alison, and in your opinion, what are the benefits to employers of making workplace well-being a priority? Certainly there, I just needed to attend to my own well-being and take a sip of water. I'd like to use an analogy that I believe uh, will resonate with many of the participants in today's webinar. And the analogy I want to use, it's entirely coincidental that, coincidental that Bureau are experts in this field, but it's the analogy of the office chair. Now I'm currently sitting on one, many of you will be too. If you don't already know how it's constructed, take a sneak peek at the base of your chair right now. Now, I'd hazard a guess that it has a load-bearing stem, uh, centrally, or a spindle situated under the seat, uh, from which five spokes, or arms as we might refer to them, project horizontally. I wish I could see you all checking this now. And each of those five prongs, those arms or those spokes, are, are likely to have a caster or a wheel uh, at its tip. That's the office chair we're referring to, not, not, the, not the, the, the sofa, not the, not the seating that you have at home, um, and not the, the dining chair that you might be perched on if you're working from your kitchen table right now. But the reason I use that analogy is because if, when, if any one of these casters came off, uh, or even if a single spoke was damaged or, or missing, the whole functionality of that chair would be compromised. I'd go so far as to say it would be rendered unusable. It wouldn't be safe to sit on. It certainly wouldn't uh, be functioning fully. Now, I teach my students that well-being at work is dependent on five things too. Hence the analogy with the, with the office chair. In the case of workplace well-being, it's not casters and spokes, but it's five components or, or pillars. And I don't know whether I've got time, David, have I, to, to maybe share what these five pillars are? Is, yeah, is sure. it okay to? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The five pillars 
of well-being at work all need to be in place and they need to be functioning well to foster well-being in the workplace and to enable every employee um, to be the best version of themselves. You've, you've heard me say that before. So these five pillars are management. Management's the first pillar. And you might think, well, that's fairly obvious. You know, any, any business is, is dependent on the quality of its leadership and management. But suffice to say that the way we manage each of us, the way we manage others, has a significant impact on the people that we manage. So my question to you around the management, if you are a manager is, and or indeed uh, to you, if you are being managed, does the manager, do you as the manager or does your manager role model, do, do they model that they take well-being seriously? Do they practice well-being? Or are you working in an environment where you evidence your commitment, you evidence your dedication to your role by burning yourself out? Um, I came into uh, clinical practice um, in my 20s uh, with the view inculcated in me that if I wanted to, to progress up the clinical career ladder, I needed to be first in the morning, last to leave at night, I needed to offer for all the on-call duties, I, I really needed to, uh, you know, evidence that I was dedicated and that I was putting my work above and beyond everything. That was the wrong message, but that was the message that was fed to me. Um, and therefore, I, I pursued that track for quite a while before realizing, in fact, that once I became a manager, I wasn't doing my people any favors if I was implying by the way I neglected well-being, didn't practice self-care, uh, but burnt myself out, that that was my uh, implicit expectation. So, so the management is, a, is one of those five pillars. The second pillar, and these are not in order of importance, because as I said with the office chair, if any one of them is missing, then the function isn't um, effective. So, so these are not, as I say, in order of importance. But the second one is the environment. Uh, and, and we heard Jean there speak very eloquently about the, the complexity and, and, and the multifaceted nature of what you can do in the environment. Um, and, and I know that um, Jean will be talking later about the, the, the standard that has been written to assist businesses in, in fulfilling these, these, that particular pillar. The third thing I would say, uh, well-being at work, uh, and it may be the obvious one, but it, it's the work. Does everyone have a degree of autonomy or control of their environment when they're at work? It's a question to all of you. It's a question you might want to ask yourselves. Are your people trusted um, to do their best uh, and, and to have some, some flexibility or are they micromanaged? Um, suffice to say, and there isn't time really to say any more in, in today's session, but if they are micromanaged or if they don't have any local control and, and any degree of autonomy, whatever the level of seniority um, or, or in indeed whether they're, they're new starts or recently joining you um, if they don't sense that they're trusted and if they don't have that local control over their their immediate workspace uh, then their well-being will almost certainly uh, be depleted or, or even non-existent the fourth pillar of well-being at work is is social relationships um, I, I think we've all come to recognize over the last 18 months that that being at work is about so much more than the work, if that makes sense. Um, it's important to recognize the vital part that relationships play within teams and departments. And it's easier to foster those relationships if there is um, in-person connectivity. And then the fifth pillar um, is access to information access to support. Um, now, most businesses now have employee assistance programs so that if, it, if somebody identifies that they are struggling with, with their mental health or with well-being at work, then, then you know, there are places they can go. They can be signposted to, to assistance. But I would suggest, and, and, and Jean made this point er earlier, you know, that really we're all diverse because we're all different and therefore we all need the variety. We, we, we all have mental health, we all have a degree of mental health, just as we all have a degree of physical health, um, but that will fluctuate and that will vary. And it's only when our mental health and physical health are, are nurtured or we take it seriously and we, we 
make an effort um, to um, practice well-being and, and to, to model uh, that we take well-being seriously, uh, you know, it's only then that we can really um, say that we are taking uh, well-being um, to heart, that, 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 that we recognise the contribution it makes. So management, environment, the work, as in the job, you know, and, and the nature of control over it, social relationships, and then access to support. And, and by attending this webinar today, each of you has expressed an interest in finding out more. Um, and um, organisations that run well-being and health initiatives that have a high profile that, that explicitly and overtly take it seriously you know we care about our employees you said this therefore we did this you know those sorts of um overt um well-being initiatives um in-house events cpd and so on that is what i mean by access to information and support yeah and i guess a, a very important part of the the, the the managing um and the improving of the well-being uh, within the workspace um, includes how we measure the impact of well-being measures and what would you say how, how can businesses go about measuring this in terms of user satisfaction productivity and engagement well the the the, the five pillars of well-being at work that i've just shared with you they form the basis of um, an opportunity to evaluate all of that um, because businesses can construct um uh, you know a either a performance review or, or um, a regular check-in with, with their people um, to get that sort of 360 perspective on, you know, how do you feel? Uh, you know, how, how would you scale? How would you rate uh, the way um, you are managed or you are led or you're, you're supported? How, you know, um, what could we do to your environment, to your local workspace, your, your um, immediate uh, area of work? You know, what could we do to improve it? The, there are a number of tools that link into these five pillars, um, which um, participants in today's webinar might, might be uh, interested in following. But essentially, using those five criteria, uh, those five pillars of well-being at work and, and benchmarking people's perspectives against that. Uh, and indeed, particularly in relation to the to the fifth one, you know, access to information and support, access to, to the, the, the past standard um, that, that Jean referenced earlier, in which I know um, people are going to be uh, encouraged to, to view. Um, these are ways of, of measuring. You, you, need to, you need to start somewhere. So you need to benchmark how is it for us how is it for our people now? And what do we aspire to do? What do we, what do we aim to achieve? What would we need to do in order to, um, if you like, take somebody from perhaps they scale their, their current situation in terms of um, the, the social relationships or the environment um, as four out of 10? The, the, the five pillars of well-being encourage you to look at what you would need to do in order to next time you review it next time you evaluate user satisfaction productivity engagement and so on um, what do we need to have done in order for that employee to return a score perhaps instead of four or five maybe of six or seven mm -hmm. yeah okay great well thanks Alison um, and Jean is, is there anything else with regards to the, the, the topic of well-being at work is there anything else that you would add to this at all yeah I think um, some really excellent points there and that the point that um, Alison made I think it was point number five about support and information and your employee assistant program um, I'm a mental health first aider at um, Hero Hapholds and we've found that to be a really beneficial program so that you've you've got your um, your qualified assistance program there, uh, people that can give support, but you've also got colleagues who've identified and had some training um, that can just listen very informally and, and provide support and signposts as well. And I think broadening that network could be really helpful because it's quite a big step sometimes for some people to, to seek that help. The other point I wanted to make, and it, it doesn't necessarily, we all have mental health, both good at, and poor at times, and um, we have this diversity in our neurocognitive profiles. But what we have found um, to be the case is that if you are neurodivergent, you can be more likely to experience anxiety and poor mental health. And I think a big part of that is linked to the environments that we're placing people in, where they are bombarded with very uncomfortable um, stimuli at, at, at times. So 
um, anxiety, GAD and, and other things are much more common on people with a neurodivergent profile. So I think we need to be uh, mindful of that as well. I think that that would be helpful. And, and the final point was really around um, engaging with your users and the voice of people, because sometimes people, some people who are neurodivergent find it less easy to go into a meeting or do a face to face thing. So we need to provide different ways for people to engage in the process so we get feedback from everyone when we're surveying and stuff. Um, not just a one size fits all, let's have a meeting face to face and, and talk about this because that's not comfortable for absolutely everyone. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, that concludes all the questions that, that I had for the panelists. Um, hopefully everyone has, has found that really insightful. It's a topic that you could talk about for a lot, lot longer. Um, Kay, I will hand over to you. Yeah. Um, can Alison just add a little bit extra there, Dave? Sorry, yeah, Before sure. Before we finish the discussion. Yeah, I just really wanted to uh, endorse what, what Jean said about the greater risk, the increased risk one faces of um, depleted well-being and poor mental health if you have um, a, a a neurodivergent condition um, that um, I mean don't don't take my word for it um, two studies that were conducted in 2019 bear this out and in 2019 the mental health foundation calculated that 91 million working days were lost in the UK to poor mental health and depleted well-being 91 million working days I'll say that again because it's such a big number now, um, I checked into this uh, to establish or, or to understand in my own mind what, what that meant in terms of the total um, labour force. So, so e the economically active population in 2019 was 34.5 million of us. Uh, we're all part of that statistic. So 34.5 million people in the UK who are economically active, who are employed, uh, between us or between them, uh, 91 <coughs> million working days were lost uh, to, to poor mental health or depleted well-being. Um, now, that's a shocking statistic, so I owe it to everybody to, to counter that with something perhaps a bit more encouraging. Um, and in 2019, uh, Deloitte published the findings of their study, which demonstrated that uh, for every one pound a business, whether it be public sector, private sector, third sector, whether it be a community group where, or whether it be, you know, an SME, every for every one pound that an organisation invests in attempts to nurture and improve well-being at work uh, so to take steps to implement all the good ideas that, that Jean shared with us today uh, for every one pound you uh, invest in that activity you can anticipate a return on that investment and this is borne out by the Deloitte report uh, which was also reported in Forbes um, magazine but um, you can expect a return on that investment of between five and seven pounds now, for, for, for many years, implementing inclusiveness for me and, and my role and my various roles um, has been about persuading um, and encouraging. And, and I won't use the word coercing, but I'm sure I've done a fair bit of that in my time, too. Uh, but I think the business case is most strongly made by, by that statistic. You invest a pound, you get a return on that investment if you take well-being seriously. So that was just what I wanted to finish with. Great. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Alison. Thank you, Alison. Um, I'm just going to run the second poll just now. Um, just a reminder, again, that, you know, it's completely anonymous.
Great. Okay, hope you found this interesting. <laughs> Certainly always interesting to see the results. Um, okay, so if anyone wants to ask a question, then feel free to add that into the chat. I don't see any there at the moment. So um, I'm just going to ask a quick question. I think there's probably more for Jean. Um, just in terms of, um, you know, we've had a conversation in, in our industry over many years about uh, creating a flexible workspace and providing people with lots of different working environments in an agile um, working environment, Jean, and there might be things in that now that perhaps people struggle with when they return. And um, I'm thinking of maybe things like hot desking, where people are returning to workplace and not terribly comfortable with the idea that they don't know where they're sitting on a particular day. Um, so if you were to recommend maybe a few small changes that businesses could make to initially make people feel comfortable, um, such as a booking system for hot desking, or you mentioned the focused calm space being really important. So the addition of maybe booths or pods, is there any sort of simple steps you would say, okay, without having to spend a lot of money making big changes, these are some key things that you should focus on? I definitely think the quiet rooms, I think, even a small organisation could probably identify, particularly at the moment where not everyone is back in the office and the hot desk in situation, hybrid working is happening. It's probably a good time to start looking around and say, okay, what, what is our office like? What does it offer? Are there, are there areas that naturally are quieter? Um, I think one of the things um, I would really like to see is some form of mapping of the environment. So this could be a, a combination of information. So if you think about when we book a theatre ticket or an air, air, airplane ticket, we get a view of the seat on plan. That's the first thing. So I would like that when we're doing hot desking, but I'd also mm -hmm. like it to say proximity to the toilets for people that, that might need the toilets more often and proximity to the tea point for people that want to be away from a busy area. Um, how close is it to windows? What, what's the temperature like there? What's the lighting like? How noisy? Is it a collaborative space? Is it a quiet zone? If we could map that information, when people are booking desks, it would be so powerful and give people control. And I, and I appreciate that some things will vary across the day. So for example, daylight coming in, which often could cause some glare, moves around the building during the course of the day. So it may be that if we had that information, someone who really suffers from, from, from glare and finds that really difficult to deal with, could say, okay, in the morning, I'm gonna book a desk over this side of the room, in the afternoon, I'm going to book a desk over here. I think it's really, it would be really um, liberating for people to have that information. And then the second, the third point, so the quiet room being the first, would be about the chairs, because although it's not specific to neurodiversity, we, we're, we're all intersectional, we have other needs as well. So physical needs is a big one. And the comfort of the chairs is all important. And I, I'd really challenge, please, some chair designers out there, please come up with a chair that has numbered settings. So when mm. someone else uses your chair, you can put it back mm. quickly rather than spending the next two hours trying to make it comfy again. That's really good. It's really good idea. Chairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, I have another question from Alison Morrison for Jean. When you talk about quiet rooms, do you mean a room for people to relax or decompress or is it somewhere quiet to work? So the, um, the quiet room that we're talking about in the past standard is, is, is um, a dedicated space for someone to go to when they've experienced sensory overload, distress, anxiety, upset, anything like that, to recover and reset. So it's like a safe bolt hole. I think in addition, we should have areas across the office that are quieter, um, where you can get your head down and do a report, or you're someone that doesn't really um, flourish amongst a lot of other noisy chatter then you could choose to work in that zone as well, a bit like the quiet carriage in a train. So um, I, I think you need both really. Uh, and then also uh, on, that, on that same subject um, from John Sanderson, having recognised a calm working area, how can I publicise it, manage access to it so that colleagues working there aren't labelled? I don't think it's about um, making this the area for people in neurodivergent. It's, it's mm -hmm. this is the area where you go that is, you know, um, if if you need a, a moment out. So it, it could be, it could some be someone with you know, recovering from bereavement, any any sort of stress. Um, it doesn't have to be just um, someone experienced sensory overload. I, I think these these calm and quiet spaces have been needed for some time. 
and some people have, have, have um, provided them combined with pet faith, but it doesn't really work very well because quite often if you're upset and you just need to, to get away from a situation for, for 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever, um, it, it's, it's that stuff, it, it's a place that needs to be reactively available when you need it. And, and that's why I think more than one is a good idea as well. Okay. Um, so I've got another question that I missed in the chat from Simon Hillier. Are we moving towards a place where standards are more weighted towards operational, social and cultural changes rather than architectural standards? Um, Jean nor Alison, what do you think? I'd be happy to respond on that. Yeah. I, I think it's a very valid question. Um, my, my short answer would be that I don't think this should be a choice between the two, that I think our architects um, are the, the foundational um, elements, you know, that, that they, they deliver um, on um, environments which uh, should take account of operational factors, of, of workflow, uh, of footfall and so on, but they should also, um, the, the best architects and, and, and the best, uh, you know, and the most appropriate architectural standards recognise um, as I said earlier, you know, that work is about so much more than just the pure completion of the task and therefore social and cultural um, uh, elements, social and cultural changes, uh, was the words, uh, the phrase Simon used, but also the implementing of inclusiveness requires a, a hand in glove relationship between um, the architects and those who like um, Jean and myself are involved in um, implementing inclusiveness and, and guiding others to, to uh, achieve that um, standard. Um, so so um, I, I don't think we're moving, but well, maybe we are moving towards a place where um, operational, social and cultural changes are taken into consideration, but it's not at the expense of architectural standards. It needs to be in partnership with, with the architects. Okay, well, and can... sorry, Jean, on you go. Okay, I was just gonna say that um, I sit on the committee for BS8300, which is um, a sort of code of practice around accessible and inclusive environments. Um, and on that, I represent the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management. And, and we have representatives from architecture and, and surveying and all sorts. Um, it's really important, it's holistic, and it's a combination of both architectural design and also the management interventions that people need to make. So I, I don't think you can get a truly inclusive environment purely by architecture or purely by management. And it's always gonna buy, be the two working together hand in hand. Um, so it's a holistic approach really. Um, but I think the architectural standards are there and we're not really undermining any of those um, with the PAS document. Thank you, Jane. Um, Jen Cloud asks, recognise the importance of behaviours in making this work in practice. Do you have any top tips for addressing these through culture change? I think that might be more Alison than me, but um, I mean, I think a lot, lot of initiatives, I mean, what we've had at Pure Happel, we have a lot, we have um, various groups that will meet up. Um, a fair community and so on that will discuss these and I think by sharing with one another um, different needs you, you do develop mutual respect and understanding and you can't just expect people to know um, so I think if you can tie in with that some awareness um, with either a formal you know formal awareness training or maybe informal chats and, and coffee catch-ups that you know and let's talk about a certain topic it's really really helpful but I think Alison might have some more on this. So, sorry to throw you in it, Alison, if you haven't. No, yeah, I don't feel thrown in it. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I think what, what we have to acknowledge is, is that um, culture and shifts in culture happen um organically it's an evolution rather than a revolution and, and we can we don't have to look too far into history to see where that there have been cultural revolutions it's all ended badly um, so i do think it's around having those conversations i think it's um around raising awareness because um we don't know what we don't know that you know that applies to all of us um and unless we've had that conversation unless we've been exposed to that information unless there's been a, a focused topic perhaps in as i said uh, in the five pillars of well-being you know a, um, a seminar or a, an in-house event or 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 a thematic that that has um been introduced within a team meeting as part of an agenda um it, it's really about getting the conversation going i think i think that's a very interesting question but 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 it's not something that we can we can't 
retrofit um, a new culture onto, you know, an existing system. It's a bit like, you know, you can't fit a new wing on a dead bird. It's not, the bird's not going to fly. Uh, and so it, it's really about um, opening up the conversation, raising awareness, uh, and then engaging everybody in, in contributing to the cultural vision that um, is either corporately um, promoted or, or, you know, um, collaboratively developed. So, so everybody should have a part in it because we're all part of the culture in which we work. We may not feel as though we are, or we may feel alien to that culture, or we may feel that there isn't a good fit. But, but as Jean said, um, true inclusiveness is, is where you find that um, everybody who is part of that environment feels fulfill their potential uh, and the problem with environments that don't take that into account is that a lot of people are not optimally productive optimally motivated or optimally effective and certainly not satisfied uh, because they don't feel as though the culture takes account of their needs that's great thanks um Gemma asks, Gemma Lightbody asks, do you think there's a generational difference in, in terms of views of the typical way of working in the office and the way we should be moving into flexible working? If so, how do you think this will or should be addressed when dealing with a business inclusive of all ages? Is that maybe one for you, Alison? Do you think it's a generational yeah. difference? I do. I, I think there's a generational difference in terms of expectation and familiarity. I, I spoke briefly that, you know, when I, when I came into um, my clinical career, which wasn't yesterday, as you can probably tell if you look at me, um, that um, the expectations were, were different. I had different expectations. I, I was far more likely to defer to um, the, the more senior people within the, the clinical team and within the context that I was setting. Uh, and I didn't feel empowered to make my needs known. Um, give you a classic example, I remember being interviewed for a promotion and one of the questions that I was asked was, um, are you likely to be leaving to have a family soon? Now, now you're probably <laughs> shocked and horrified that that would be a question. Um, and, and that, you know, that sort of in a way illustrates the, the change in expectations. So I'm delighted to say that, that our uh, millennials and, and, and our, the younger generation within our workforces and workplaces will be more likely to be able to vocalize what they need in order to be the best version of themselves. Now that should never be at the, 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 to the disadvantage of the, the multi-generational workplace and, and most workplaces are if they're inclusive as, as, as the questioner said. Um, the, you know, there is a wide variety. We should be uh, we should be welcoming sixteen year olds into our businesses, and we shouldn't be kicking sixty five year olds out the minute uh, they reach that that chronological age. Um, so I do think there's a difference. I don't think one is entirely right and one is entirely wrong. But I, I, I think what we benefit from um, in, in the 21st century is that we tend to have people who, because of their awareness, feel more empowered to be able to. Um, that vocalise their expectations and negotiate um, adaptations to, to suit them. Great, thank you. Um, I've got another two questions. I know we're kind of nearing the, the 10 o'clock, so hopefully we can um, we can get these answered. Um, Helen Kane asks, mapping the environment sounds great, but as the sensory issue are complex and affect people differently, how could you involve a section of people impacted and someone trained to map to collate feedback? Would either of you, Jean, Jean, sorry, I think you're speaking, but I can't hear you. Have you got, are you on mute there? No, you've lost your voice. <laughs> I think we've lost Jean for the moment. Okay, I'll just move on to, to the next question. Um, and if we don't get a chance to answer that one, Helen, on, on the um, webinar, then we'll come back to you on that. Um, if we can get Jean back. Um, and the, the next one is what place does legislation have in affecting change? Are you able to answer that one, Alison? 
Yes, yeah, I think legislation has a very significant part uh, to play in effective change, um, in, in catalyzing change. Um, and that's because um, we, we have, when we look at codes of practice, um, that, you know, the, the worthy uh, employer, the worthy corporate entity will, will, will um, investigate that and do what they can to fulfill that code of practice um, we we have no option but but to uh, comply with with legislation uh, I'm not a fan of compliance at the expense of everything else uh, but but the legislation has a lot to offer particularly where you fulfill a role in your organization where you're trying to, to instigate change where you're trying to implement inclusive uh, inclusiveness you can defer to the legislation um the equalities act is is uh, very helpful in this and of course the equalities act identifies nine protected characteristics all of which need to be taken into consideration within the the workplace uh, but yes i i would say uh, a, a canny use of of the legislation can be a a helpful lever um if you're trying to get buy-in from reluctant um finance directors or or, or reluctant uh, ceos Thank you. Um, Jean, did you manage to restore your sound? I think so. Can you hear me yes, now? you're back. <laughs> That's okay. good. Um, Jean, the question from Helen was, yeah. mapping the environment sounds great, but as the sensory issues are complex and affect people differently, how could you involve a section of people impacted and someone trained to map to collate feedback? I think a lot of the... Um, I think this is where technology comes in. I think there could be an automated form of um, feedback. So, um, for example, what we wouldn't want to introduce is something that's very onerous because then it makes it less likely people will, you know, repeat that exercise. Mm -hmm. But constant feedback as you as you log off from your desk about how was it for you today? Is there anything that wasn't right? Could be really helpful over time to making sure you continue to map the right information um, and that where someone is continually identifying, obviously they can do that through their workplace adjustment request and say, no, actually, none of these environments work for me. I, I do actually need something different. Can we do, can we do more, please? Um, it, it is complex, as Helen said, um, and everyone's going to be a bit different. But I think that might be the way to go. We can only learn from the feedback. Absolutely. Um, and on that point, actually, when we finish, um, there will be a survey and, and please um, add any questions that we haven't answered or covered in the webinar that because we, obviously we, we start to run out of time. Um, I just wanted to say that the session has been recorded and I will send that on to everybody who's um, attended if you want to share with any of your colleagues um, and I'll also include in the email the link to the past that Jean has referenced throughout the webinar. Um, so just finally to end and say thank you very much to Alison and Jean for sharing all their expert knowledge. It's been really interesting, fantastic discussion. Um, Dave, do you want to add anything before we go? Yeah, just, just to echo that really, Kay, and say thanks so much to Jean and Alison. It's been a hugely um, insightful conversation. Hopefully it's you know added a lot of benefit to those that have attended today. And um, we will be carrying on the, the conversation as well, um, but we'd really appreciate any feedback that people have um, as well um, would be really beneficial to all of us. So yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.